Excellencies, distinguished guests, including to our many colleagues who I understand are online, um, welcome to this event on Migration is about people and MGI stories of policy impact. I first of all have to thank the governments of the United States, Brazil, Nepal, and Mauritius who've joined us today to share their experience using the migration governance indicators to inform policy change and the positive impact that it's had on migrants and communities. And I just want to pause a bit to share a bit of a personal reflection. So for me, MGI was a bit of a hidden, like a hidden golden egg, because when you hear the term MGI, it sounds very technical, and when you hear indicators, it sounds a bit geekish. But then, um, kind of almost by accident, uh, David Martineau, my colleague, decided that he was going to give me a briefing on the, on the uh, MGI. I have a background in, res in um, results-based management, so I was fully ready for a very technical discussion on indicators and instead found out about this really, really great tool that facilitates a process that brings together um, all of the departments of government. So a whole, what we, I mean, really putting into practice a whole of government approach. Um, it's also very demand driven um, by the governments and it allows a comprehensive way to deal with the multi-dimensional multi aspects um, of migration. And ever since I realized this, I have been such a, well, I'd like to think, I hope my colleagues think, I'm such a strong champion for the use of MGI, though I will vote for a different name if anybody has Great, great ideas. Um, I've been such a champion of this and deeply appreciative of how this has enabled IOM to support um, member states with um, their migration um, policies or integrating migration across other policies. So it's a, it's a personally, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. I also want to thank our moderator for this session, Mata Samuel from The Economist Impact for being with us. Um, the Economist Impact is our MGI partner for almost a decade um, and we truly value this partnership and are looking forward to seeing it grow even more um, in, the, in the coming years. And before I give the floor to our very distinguished panel, and apart from being distinguished, um, they're also my, I'd like to say my friends. <laughs> um, I have just a few words to say on migration policy and governance and why it matters. And at the end of the day, it goes back to the title of this event, which is migration is about people. And that's really why um, it matters, because we want better outcomes for people. We want to fully harness the potential of migration. And we want to support governments um, in achieving uh, this potential. Too often, it's seen as something abstract and far removed from daily life, but we know that systemic change and deep transformations are not impossible, are not, are impossible without improving policies and institutional frameworks. For IOM, as we engage with our member states and partners to support better migration policies and good migration governance, the central message is clear. Migration policy is about people, and you would have heard our DG Amy Pope speaking on day one of the council about um, her vision, and people first is at the center um, of her vision. Sound migration policies are essential if we're to realize the promise of migration, and as recently documented by the World Bank in its 2023 development report, Migration, migrants can contribute much to the destination's economy, efficiency, and growth over the long term. 
about 17% of healthcare workers in the United States, 12% in the UK, 79% in GCC countries are foreign born. Remittances sent by migrants reached $840 billion, which is more than foreign direct investment and ODA respectively. And if you add the informal channels, estimates are that remittances are actually above a trillion dollars a year. The long-term benefits of immigration include increased entrepreneurship and innovations, stronger links for international trade and investment, and better provision of services such as education and health care. All of us in this room know that when migration is well managed, we can unlock its tremendous potential in a way that benefits migrants themselves, communities of origin, transit, as well as destination. So as I started with, um, after more than two years in IOM, I've had the tremendous privilege to meet with many migrants and listen to their stories. Most continue to face hurdles as they move to escape conflict disasters and the impact of climate change in search of better life and new opportunities. And they're ready to contribute to their communities. And that is why um, migration is about people and how we can serve them. I've also met with countless governments who have the utmost commitment to create regular pathways for migrants and their families. We heard this today in many of the statements that member states have uh, that member states made and in many instances governments and migrants want the same outcome but don't have the right structures to make it happen working together we can find the solutions that and not just um, or as our dg says the triple win solutions and this is where the migration governance indicators come in um, and as i uh, as I mentioned, it helps governments um, take a hard look at the policies they have in place to manage migration. To date, 109 countries, 91 local governments have participated in um, an assessment using the MGI, demonstrating a truly global footprint. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to pass it back um, to the moderator. I have a few more notes on um, examples from Ethiopia, cities in Moldova, the Marshall Islands, but um, the purpose of all of you being here today is to hear um, from the panelists, and so I will um, stop my opening there. Welcome once again, and I hand over to you, Matthews. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, um, the DG Daniels, and thank you IOM and especially the MGI team for um, inviting me, but for hosting this fantastic event. Um, as the DG Daniels uh, mentioned, my name is Matthias Samel. I'm a senior manager at Economist Impact, the research arm of the Economist Group, and we have been working with the MGI team for the past many years um, on developing the MGI process and the program. And I'm extremely excited to be here today to discuss some of the results and the applications in real life um, and the experiences from our really distinguished uh, panel. So thank you and thank you everyone in the room and uh, tuning in online. But without further ado, um, I'll just quickly introduce our um, amazing panel, um, and then we'll just uh, jump right in, into it. So um, we have with us um, Ms. Elizabeth Campbell, um, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration at the U.S. Department of State. Welcome and thank you. Um, she is responsible for humanitarian assistance in Africa um, and multilateral coordination and external affairs. And prior to this, Ms. Campbell was the director of ANRAS uh, representative office in Washington, D.C. 
Thanks. Secondly, um, we are delighted to have Mr. Augusto J. Aruda Botello, um, who serves as a act, who is acting as the National Secretary of Justice and uh, Vice Minister of Justice and Public Security in Brazil since 2000. 23, um, and he's a lawyer specialized in economic criminal law um, with the University of Cumbria, um, University of Salamanca, and um, FGV. And previously, he was an advisory board member at uh, Human Rights Watch, as well as the Innocencia uh, project. He's also involved uh, with the Rede Libertade project um, created in 2019 to defend individual, um, individuals and social organizations facing violations of fundamental rights. Thank you. Um, thirdly, uh, we are delighted to have uh, Mr. Kewal Prasad Bandari, um, who currently serves as the Secretary of Ministry of Labor, Employment and Social Security of Nepal, and boasts a distinguished 32-year-long career in the civil service in the country. And um, Secretary Bandari is responsible for overseeing key areas uh, such as domestic, labor relations, skills, um, as well as occupational safety and health. And prior to his current role, um, he held a position as a member secretary at the National Planning Commission, MPC, and has an extensive background in working at the Ministry of Finance. And last but absolutely not least, uh, we're really delighted to have Her Excellency Usha Chandi Dwarka Kanabari, who is the Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary Permanent Representative of Mauritius. And uh, prior to her appointment in Geneva, Her Excellency had been serving as a Secretary of Foreign Affairs of Mauritius since 2015. And prior to that, uh, she was the head of the Multilateral Economic Directorate at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, International Trade and Regional Integration in Port Louis from 2007 to 2013. So thank you everyone, I uh, really appreciate uh, you being here. And just a very quick note, as uh, you can imagine, the event is being uh, filmed and photographed uh, for communication purposes, so hopefully everybody's okay with that. Um, but without uh, further ado, um, let us just jump right into it. And I'm really excited to, to hear your in insights and experiences. And um, Ms. Campbell, let me start um, with you. Um, the US government obviously has been the main donor behind the MGI since uh, the very beginning in 2016. And I know that your government um, has been using MGI in a sort of innovative ways uh, and insights from MGI um, to inform pro program designs and interventions. Um, could you just tell us a bit more about your approach and perhaps the value of uh, MGI and the insights for evidence-based uh, programming and really capturing the needs of the people on the ground? Thank you. Yeah, sure, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here and to speak about something that is of great importance to the State Department and, and the U.S. government um, and a key partnership that we have uh, with, with IOM. So one enormous value add of the MGI is the fact that it provides a comprehensive baseline for migration management. So I think we all know how difficult it is to define something like migration management in clear, measurable terms, um, let alone um, to identify um, its quality or success. So the MGI has taken a complex qualitative idea and developed a tool to measure it. So in addition to the MGI, um, we at the State Department also fund three regional migration programs through IOM in Africa, in Asia, and the Americas. So as the MGI has grown and increased in its coverage, we've seen closer integration um, between the MGI assessments and these um, regional migration programs. So, for example, after participating in MGI assessments, several countries have worked with IOM under these regional programs to develop 
comprehensive national migration policies that adopt a whole of government approach. One specific example comes from Southern Africa where IOM supported a partner government, um, their ministerial committee on migration to develop an action plan to realign the existing migration programs with the MGI assessment report um, for that country. So we think that it's poised to compare assessment outcomes across regions and identify individual areas of work um, that will have um, great cross-cutting um, impact. Um, and all of this means, in, in short, that we can approach the various regional dialogues in which we're all a part and other partnerships with a toolkit and a recommended um, playbook of information to plan for um, efficient and effective uh, new programming. Thank you so much. It's really exciting to, to hear this, uh, both the integration uh, with other programs and also the application on, um, on the ground and uh, inform, using the information and insights for uh, program delivery. Thank you so much. And just um, turning, um, Mr. Botello, to you, um, obviously um, in Brazil, the migration landscape and context has changed significantly in, in recent years, which obviously requires a, a sort of new measures and responses. And I know that um, uh, MGI process um, has also been an important sort of tool for providing the analysis and uh, reality uh, check on the ground. Um, could you tell us um, how your sort of policies, uh, new approaches are responding to the ch uh, challenges that the country is facing in this area today? Well, first of all, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all. Uh, let me be quite honest here. As you see, my background is on criminal law, right? I've been working as a criminal lawyer for the past 20 years. When I was appointed as National Secretary of Justice, who is the one in charge for the migration and refugee policy in my country, I, I knew and my knowledge about migration was about the same as I had on biology, which is close to zero. In 11 months, I had to learn a lot to put in practice the new policy on migration, refugee, and statelessness that we are putting together in Brazil. So, uh, with that, I can easily answer that without indicators, without the work of IOM, without the work of MGI, I was probably more lost than ever. So it's fundamental that we have your work and the partnership that my country has uh, with IOM to help us build, as you said, a country that has been changing a lot when you think about uh, migration patterns and migration flow. Uh, the Brazilian migration law is actually quite new. Uh, it's from May uh, 2017, and it changed completely the, the way that the Brazilian law faces uh, the scenario. The previous uh, law was very focused on security aspects and only uh, containing uh, very restrict ways to, 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 to promote uh, migration. Today our law is fully based on human rights as a, a principle, and especially bringing to all migrants and refugees all the access, universal access, to all the services, programs, and social benefits that our country has uh, disposal to absolutely everybody. So the new law changed the, the migratory reality in Brazil. Uh, this was the, the basis and this was the response that gave a positive answer to the African and Ukrainian diaspora that we had in our country, also from Haiti and Venezuela. And now what we are dealing with a new, completely different way 
to look at a national policy. I think I'll be able to answer this in a better way in the next question. But what we are trying to do in a, in a completely new way of building a policy. We had more than 200 organizations from civil society helping us to put uh, this policy together. We had the help of IOM, we had the help of the whole academia in Brazil. We had more than 1,400 written uh, uh, suggestions to this, to this policy that we now, uh, we, we, we could transform these suggestions into a, uh, into a policy that will soon be being presented. But uh, without the work of MGI and without indicators, uh, our construction will be much, much more harder to do. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And, and um, yeah, we'll definitely delve um, deeper into the question of bringing in stakeholders at various levels. I think that's that's really, really critical. Um, and But also thank you uh, for bringing up the um, sort of um, a role of MGI is, is setting the baseline, particularly in um, the times of change. And uh, we all see that the, the, the rapid changes that are happening around the world really require to having that sort of common understanding. And um, that's really great to, to hear um, from your experience. Um, turning to you, Mr. Bandari, um, obviously Nepal in recent years has been um, um, among the leaders in terms of the discussion on um, migration and development policies and um, including becoming a global compact champion. Um, and now uh, you are developing the 16th National Development Plan. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the sort of broad uh, outlines of the, of the plan and how perhaps NGI results um, could contribute to informing and shaping your approach and your thinking when it comes to that migration development dynamics? Thank you, moderator. It is interesting that Nepal is still have a young population uh, every year. 500,000 Nepali youth come to labor market, but the national capacity of observed less than 100,000. So 400,000 Nepali youth need to seek their employment abroad. And not only for the labor market, uh, every year 100,000 plus Nepali student also uh, go uh, overseas for higher studies. And this statistics is out of India, because India and Nepal have a special border relation, so many people can go to India and Indian people can come to Nepal. So Nepal's population mm -hmm. is uh, a young population are serving globally, more than 140 countries, Nepali uh, youth are working in, in, uh, in unskilled, skilled or high skilled job. So migration is one of the uh, great contributor of Nepal's socio-economic uh, uh, area, socio-economic field. Uh, the remittances scores uh, is equivalent to 25% of national GDP. That means migration is one of the important uh, pillar of Nepal's economy. And uh, the running 15th plan and coming 16th plan focus for safe migration, sending youth with skills and occupational safety, with language also, and uh, providing other services, safer migration. And Nepal also launched the reintegration after, after completing two years, three years as a labor market, serving in other country, people come back home and they start their own business or they start working in, 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 in home country. So this entire cycle is involves Nepal's uh, economic development. Even during COVID, uh, Nepal's economy is not that much down because the people who are working abroad send money for their families for living and treatment and all the things. So country is graduating uh, in 2026 from LDC to um, middle income country. And for this, economic vulnerability and human asset is completely 
dependent on the remittance of the people, families. So for the 16th plan, we, we, we are uh, introducing more schemes for these skills, uh, especially for the dropout children who drop school in, the, in middle education, and for other people who want to go other country, specialized training, skills, language. And these are the activities, and involving with the regional and uh, global uh, uh, migration forum to advocating these things, and making um, agreement, bilateral agreement to the country where Nepali people are going to work, and uh, uh, providing them social security in their country also. So these are the activities going on. Yeah, wonderful, and thank you. It's really great to hear um, also that the regional dynamics that I would like to dig deeper into a little bit. Um, but um, just now moving on, um, Madam Ambassador, um, as you can imagine, um, in one of the latest uh, MGI reports for Mauritius, um, climate change came out as a, one of the top priorities uh, for the country. Obviously, as a small um, island developing state, um, Mauritius is at the forefront um, of uh, some of these challenges stemming from climate change, especially as they relate to um, migration. So could you just tell us a little bit more about how uh, you are addressing uh, some of these challenges and the interaction between migration policy and climate change? Thank you very much, moderator. And, uh Oh, yeah. This is to a man, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, moderator, and, and thank you all for taking time to be here. Um, you know, before the MGI 2018, which was the first time Mauritius, Mauritius had done something else. We had in 2017 what we call the third national communication on environment and on climate change. And that third communication actually already spoke about migration and climate change, a whole section on that because we're already witnessing a number of things that are happening in the area. When you're a small island, you're exposed in any case, so it's going to happen. You don't wait for people to tell you what's going to happen. What did we do? Um, we started working with IUM quite a lot, in fact, and then there were the broader things and the smaller things. The broader things, all of us do. The Climate Change Act 2020, the Master Plan 2022, the decision by government to accelerate uh, it's uh, the reduction of its emissions by 2030 by 40%, as though we were going to change the world, but still, we wanted to do it sort of thing, you know? And then the smaller things, which to me are important, because I think in all that we do, as you said, migration is about people, and it's the people that you want to save. So on the smaller things, I wanted to pick up a couple of projects and share with you. Alternative livelihoods. We went down to the fishermen in a very small village in Mauritius called <coughs> Riviere de Galli, where you have the small stones, the Galli, sort of thing. And there, because the fishermen would have had to move from that region. The focus was not on find, finding alternative livelihoods for the fishermen, but for their spouses. Because we thought the fishermen were not going to be wanting to um, move so much. So it was very interesting because the bank got together with the government and funded some of the women, and they started producing something, a green outcome, a green output which was using palm leaves of Mauritius, and Reshma knows there are plenty of palm leaves in Mauritius, making plates, disposable plates for the palm leaves. Then we had a second situation in Rodrigue Island. And Rodrigue Island is the dependency of Mauritius. There again, the fishermen didn't really want to be reconverted. So we created a marine park. And we got the fishermen in the southeast, Rodrigue Island, to do that. What helped was this mapping between IOM and Mauritius of vulnerable spaces and then you know, vulnerable uh, communities so that you could match them together at that one to make it work. Then, of course, there were some other Interesting things, in Quatre Soeurs, again a very small village on the east coast, we created, it's, it's frequent flooding, frequent flooding, so we created what we call a sanctuary, using alternative construction methods, it's the first of its kind in the Indian Ocean, so it gives sanctuary to 1,000 people from frequent flooding, and it is there, so we want to use it as an example, to do it again in the region, hopefully IUM can help us take this to the other islands, in the Indian Ocean that you don't look at enough sufficiently, so you look at us, please, on this one. We can replicate that model as well. 
There have been other things as well, and two interesting things I want to, to share with you is, because people are always surprised, is working with IAEA and working with SADC. With SADC, it was a vulnerable assessment of agriculture, making crop projections, where you go, uh, disaster risk reduction. With IAEA, it is getting my vegetables to become more resistant to heat and climate change. People don't even imagine IAEA is doing this. They are doing this in many countries. But you need to share all the time so they know they can go to IAEA and do. And then, of course, in the budget in 2020, 19, 20, we decided we were going to pay for relocating people where landslides had taken place. So you had that. In the meanwhile, coastal works, you know, 20 kilometers, priority areas, all that's been done. But government is very much hands-on because you're so small and you can only displace people in this amount of area sort of thing. Thank you. Wonderful thing. And these are um, absolutely extraordinary um, examples. So really, thank you for bringing those up. And um, I think that the point on um, understanding the vulnerable communities more holistically where it comes to women and spouses and, and other perhaps uh, um, you know members of the community that are not uh, on the forefront uh, of um, many people's thoughts is, is really important and I'll definitely would like to to sort of uh, follow up on that and dig a little deeper in that um, but um, F turning to you, uh, Ms. Campbell, um, when we are thinking about um, the sort of regular pathways, um, obviously the U.S. Um, has been playing a key role in, in, in the discussion and um, discussing the um, sort of creating opportunities for people to, to move through these uh, regular pathways. Um, in your view, um, um, how can the MGI and, and these approaches be helpful um, in terms of um, helping you, helping the governments um, to really think about creating opportunities for people to, to move around in a safe and um, orderly and, and regular manner? Thank you. Um, at this stage, one of the MGI's greatest strengths is its regional coverage. So, for example, in Central and South America, we have near complete geographic coverage. Cities in this region have also undertaken local MGI assessments in really large numbers. Uh, the same is true in Western, uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. So this means that uh, the MGI provides comprehensive coverage of regions with both significant internal migration and high potential for the development or expansion of intra-regional mobility. So strengthening regular pathways uh, to all possible destination countries is of course very important to explore but increasing intra-regional pathways will likely allow for the greatest impact on migration management with the best outcomes um, for migrants. Um, so after participating in the MGI, many countries have um, undertaken further work with IOM to increase their migration governance capacity. And this underscores IOM's position as a mutual trusted partner. They're well, well situated to act as a convener on migration dialogues and to evaluate regional migration management trends and identify key areas of mutual interest that, if addressed, might have the greatest impact on expanding these regular pathways. It would be interesting to see the MGI organize an assessment of existing and potential regular pathway opportunities within different regions. Um, based on the publicly available MGI report data, for example, which groups of countries present the most strategic and efficient opportunities from a logistical migration governance perspective. Countries might also opt in to collaborate with IOM on policy or other capacity changes identified by the MGI that will directly impact specific or new existing pathways. Wonderful, thank you. And that's a fantastic suggestion. We'll definitely take that on board uh, and work on it. And I think that element of intra-regional migration and the requirements for bringing stakeholders together um, in that one dialogue is really, really important. And um, 
Mr. Botello, um, you mentioned that um, obviously within the with the new um, policy, um, it required a lot of work at uh, with with stakeholders across different levels. So I know that uh, uh, local governments in Brazil have been given a, a sort of key role to, to play and play the key role in this process. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that process and that engagement and how you and your government work with uh, local authorities and the stakeholders on local level to really ensure that policies reflect the needs of people on the ground and are also implemented um, on the ground? Well, I think this is our now our biggest challenge. Of course, that uh, migrants and refugees, they enter any country through their borders, if it is from land or air, but they don't stay in the place that they naturally get inside the country. So what the federal government uh, is responsible, is responsible for migration in a macro comprehensive uh, way, defining rules for visas, entry and stay, naturalization, protection of refugees. Local governments, on the other hand, uh, they are responsible, or at least they are supposed to be uh, responsible, as of course uh, they are much closer to the population than we are, um, for directly helping and integrating uh, the population and, and communities. Uh, the demands that individuals have in relation to public authorities, they, they first arrive in the cities, in the municipalities. And that was quite a challenge, bring, trying to bring the cities together with the federal government. And the way that we managed to do that, it was, it's quite recent. We launched that in November now. It's called uh, the Network of Welcoming cities. It's a national net network of welcoming cities. It's an initiative that reaffirms the national guideline to decentralize democratic and particip participatory governance in the implementation of this new uh, national policy. The main objectives here are to support the development of institutional capacities for local integration of the migrant, refugees, and stateless person, as well to expand the institutionalization of municipal policy for migrants. Uh, by establishing these spaces in the local areas, we tend to expand the dialogue and put the cities in the leading role by sharing with them technical support, sharing with them uh, resources, and making them the priority decision maker uh, of how to manage the migration that, as I said in the beginning, cross the border but by the end of the day, we'll stay in a city, we'll stay in a state. So this is our, as I said, uh, our biggest challenge, but calling the cities uh, more closer to the federal government was the way that uh, we, we plan to, 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 to do this new policy. That's a wonderful example, um, and I think that the idea that, yes, this is the challenge for a lot of countries, for a lot of regions, um, how to cooperate um, across, um, across different levels and stakeholders, but uh, the idea of putting the regional authorities at the very center um, is, is, is um, really exciting, and, and I love the, the, the name of the national network of welcoming cities, so uh, definitely something for us to, to uh, you know, think about. Um, Mr. Bandari, uh, you mentioned um, 
the role of Nepal uh, in uh, in terms of the regional uh, migration, and also actually the MGI in 2019 uh, found that uh, Nepal played a very active role um, in regional labor migration processes, um, and in terms of advocating and protecting the migrant workers. Um, could you please um, elaborate a little bit, tell us a little bit more about um, that role and um, that you have played and the, the role to really strengthen and continue to strengthen the plans, uh, the plans for regional dialogue and um, coordination, particularly on um, labor migration and regular pathways. Thank you. Nepal is an active member of uh, regional dialogue. Uh, processes are Abu Dhabi dialogue. Uh, Bali process on people smuggling, trafficking in person and related transnational crimes, and Colombo process. These three regional dialogue uh, are there in Nepal actively participating all three forums. Uh, Nepal is a founding member of this, uh, this forum, and Nepal was a chair from 2017 to 2021 on Colombo process during that time. A Kathmandu declaration was made uh, with participation of the 12, 12 liver sending country of that region. So the safe, regular, and managed migration was the motto, the theme of the Kathmandu declaration, where we prescribe ensuring regular pathways for migrant workers, sustained joint effort towards no recruitment cost to migrant workers, strengthen grievances mechanism and remove any obstacles that may inhibit migrant worker access to justice by using technologies, maximizing partnership with the countries of destination and other stakeholders, promote migrant worker and their families access to social protection throughout the migration process, and joint effort to provide gender responsive and evidence-based information for migrant worker at all stages. So these are the uh, um, um, main um, a topic of the Kathmandu Declaration, and we are working on that. And for streamlining these things in, in the national plan, um, Nepal actively uh, working with the recruiting agency, skill agency, other, um, other, other related stakeholders, including civil society and NGO. So how we make the safer migration, uh, and how people came back home. Uh, after completion of their contract. So in this, um, uh, uh, in this process, Nepal, uh, so next week we have the meeting of the Colombo process thematic group. I possibly join there in, in Colombo. So Nepal and other country, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, even India, is doing um, uh, excellent, uh, providing excellent human resources in global labor market. So uh, the people of our continent has right to receive the facility, social protection, health care, because they, they provide service in, in the destination country and pay the tax. So the social protection is also one of the issues presently we are uh, discussing with the recipient country. And streamlining these things, uh, uh, Nepal actively involved in the domestic process of making, finalizing migrant uh, labor policy and, uh, and the process of drafting of national migration policy. I myself a disaster replaced from the Himalayan region 55 years ago. I, I from the disaster replaced from the landslide in the, in the Himalayan region. So many people of, you know, who are migrating, not only for the job, but uh, the climate change is one of the reasons that people migrate from one area to another area. The last census shows that um, between two census, five million people have internal migration. So we have to take care of this from the villages to city center, city center to provincial headquarters and the national headquarters, capital. So engaging them. And if people want to go abroad for work or studies, we have to manage them by uh, whatever means available in country and what is the capacity of country? We are trying to manage these things. 
Wonderful. And that's a really in interesting and, uh, I guess, encouraging example of that sort of balancing between that uh, sort of re regional uh, cooperation and also really incorporating or aligning it with the, the internal policies and politics. So um, I'm sure challenges remain, but really, really encouraging. So hopefully, uh, hopefully we, can, uh, we can use that as a, as a positive um, uh, example. So IOM is uh, technically supporting Mm -hmm. Ministry of Labour Employment for this process, right. drafting uh, national migration policy, finalising labour for labour labour uh, migration policy, and other activities mm -hmm. uh, in the whole process. Okay. I am with there. And and putting that to, to those sort of social services and security at the centre of that, it's it's really really great to see. Um, and uh, so. Madam Ambassador, um, sticking to that uh, um, question of la labor um, migration, and you uh, mentioned um, a couple of examples where the sort of alternative employment um, uh, was um, obviously the, the center of, of attention. And um, we know that uh, from the um, MGIs as well, that, that Mauritius has been um, among the leaders in terms of that um, sort of uh, gender sensitive migration policies and I, I know you touched upon that uh, in, in in your first response um, and I'm sure there are many challenges but could you uh, just share your view in your experience how Mauritius is addressing these issues um, and uh, perhaps if there are gaps remaining or what are the challenges that you are facing let's look at the room the majority are women Gender is always a difficult one. I have a few brothers from Gabo and Gambia, and I think Thailand, but not very many of them. Um, you know, one of the things that Statistics Mauritius does every year is an annual survey, and this is on employment and earnings of migrant workers. And that is disaggregated by migratory status and by gender. So this is one thing that informs uh, uh, policy making and decision making. So that is one concrete thing we do. But by far and large, you know, when you're a small country, your attention is divided in 50,000 things. The focus there is more on how do we protect best migrants as a whole, knowing well that in that chain, the women migrants are the more vulnerable one. So if you go back and look at the Employment uh, Rights Act of Mauritius, you will see some interesting things. An employer is not allowed to do away with his agreement. He cannot terminate an agreement on the basis of race, color, etc., but also on sex on gender, on pregnancy, on marital status, and on family responsibilities. There are not very many pieces of legislation around in the world that specifies all of this. And guess who handles most of the family responsibilities or pregnancy for that matter? So I think it is inherent in the Rights Act itself that you can't be doing all of that. Then, maybe I should add this, you know, um, uh, IOM sends a lot of people outside to represent them. And I think it's an extremely important post. Uh, more than a decade ago, Mauritius started something called the ethical recruitment process. And this was thanks to a lady who was representing the IUM at that time I was foreign secretary. She, Lalini Virasami, who I believe my sister Daniel knows well, she was very influential over the government to say, you're getting a lot of workers coming in from China, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. You need to have an ethical recruitment process. People just cannot employ people anywhere. And she actually succeeded. So now you have all these standards which have been set. And then she was good because she knew the region well. She understood the region well. She actually got persuaded government that she needed to do more. And they have in regular inspection. They, they created standards, like accommodation standards for unskilled workers. And you have inspectors that go and check these standards, and especially women. You know, when they go again, the women, how they are. But you get unskilled women workers. It's really one chain of exploitation if you're not careful. So you really have to have the legal framework that gives them the protection that they want. But there were two more things. One was social security benefits. So any foreign worker in Mauritius gets the same as a national worker gets the same free health care treatment, etc. But also they contribute and their money is kept. And when they leave, they get the money back, their contribution with interest. And then there was this addition that when they leave, they will also suppose they pass away in between. So the next in can gets it. So in a way, again, women are very often protected either by being a worker himself or herself, or again, by being the person who is receiving at the other end of this. 
And then one thing that we don't talk about is domestic violence and violence. So the Domestic Violence Act in Mauritius, again, protects everybody. So not only the people in the country, but this as well. And in 2019, I, I read this summer, government established an adult migrant shelter for people who had been victims of trafficking. And for children who were victims of trafficking, there was the Child Development Unit, but also drop-in centers in the capital city in Paulwe, et cetera. So because Mauritius government has this culture of tripartism, working with all other stakeholders, they supported a lot of the faith organizations and other NGOs also supporting women migrants. So I think all in all, whilst we didn't have a direct policy aimed at migrants, I think the open approach made it possible for women to be well protected in the area. Thank you. That's, uh, that's fascinating to hear. And uh, as you highlighted, it's uh, that sort of holistic approach, right? So not necessarily just focusing on, on gender, but realizing what it means, whether it comes to legal protection, social security, um, and um, all the, the elements that are um, disproportionately um, affecting women. So that's, that's really great to hear that this sort of holistic approach actually can work, uh, although I'm sure it's not easy to sort of achieve and develop, but uh, it's, um, it can be effective, and that's, that's what we want to see. Um, so I think just in the interest of time, um, we have covered a huge uh, number of, of issues and topics. None of them are easy. Um, so we, we talked about employment, social services, the importance of uh, creation of regional um, and regular pathways, regional cooperation, intra-regional, but also uh, local and putting local stakeholders at the very center of decision making um, and also in the sort of impact of climate change and what challenges um, and that creates specifically. So um, just want to thank you, uh, everyone, thank the panel, um, and just wanted to see if there are any um, immediate questions um, or any comments uh, from, um, um, from the um, audience. I believe that uh, someone from Honduras had a comment on question, please. Gracias. Procederé a realizar mi intervención en español. No sé si hay algún problema con ello. Espero que no. Bueno, nosotros agradecemos eh, la invitación a, a este evento. Honduras, con mucho gusto queremos intervenir para destacar nuestra experiencia en el uso de los indicadores de gobernanza migratoria para diseñar nuestra política migratoria nacional. Sin duda, el proceso de elaboración de esta política ha sido un largo proceso, asistido afortunadamente por el equipo técnico de OIM en Honduras. Asimismo, la elaboración de esta política ha implicado una serie de consultas a nivel local y nacional para conocer los obstáculos que se enfrentan día a día las, las distintas autoridades gubernamentales y debemos reconocer que esta herramienta ha sido una importante guía para conducir los distintos diálogos. Honduras enfrenta ahora una, una serie de desafíos de, de carácter estructural, pero que también han sido reforzados por situaciones como la pandemia del COVID y otros desastres ambientales, así como también la violencia y la criminalidad organizada que persiste en nuestra región. Y en este contexto, algo que ha sido fundamental es el compromiso de nuestro gobierno con la protección de los derechos humanos de las personas migrantes. Así, con, con el apoyo de, de OIM, se elaboró la política migratoria humanista, que implica ordenar, coordinar y articular los mandatos institucionales nacionales, y cuyo proceso inició en 2019, pero que atendiendo al compromiso de nuestro gobierno, su diseño ha avanzado a un paso muy rápido, teniendo ahora un documento que prioriza una serie de ejes transversales como la participación popular, la equidad, los derechos humanos, el desarrollo territorial, la interculturalidad y consideraciones ambientales y ejes de acción como la gestión integrada de las fronteras, el fortalecimiento de capacidades para identificar y atender a las personas víctimas de trata y tráfico, eh, y la protección de las personas en movilidad humana que se encuentran en situación de vulnerabilidad como los niños, niñas y adolescentes y las personas desplazadas por razones de violencia que en nuestro país eh, son, son muchísimas. El carácter integral de esta política sin duda no sería posible sin la participación activa de autoridades nacionales y locales y la asistencia de OIM y otros actores, como lo hemos dicho anteriormente, y quisiéramos destacar el, el, el papel y la importancia que, que se ha tenido al respecto. Y pues creemos que todavía hay mucho por avanzar, 
eh, que sin duda se requiere de mayor cooperación internacional en aspectos tales como el reforzamiento del rol de las alcaldías, autoridades municipales, para que se incluyan a las comunidades y personas migrantes en tránsito, en los planes de desarrollo municipales, en línea con una de las experiencias descritas por, por, por este panel, por una de las personas panelistas. Eh, pues finalizamos eh, eh, diciendo que confiamos en que seguiremos contando con el apoyo de la OIM Honduras en la implementación de esta política, que es una siguiente etapa. Y agradecemos enormemente a los panelistas el día de hoy por compartir su experiencia en este día. Muchas gracias. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, that's really encouraging, really exciting to hear and um, also uh, bringing in those uh, various elements of environmental challenges and crimes and um, how uh, this sort of holistic approach uh, to migration really, really plays a critical role. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. Any other questions or comments from the forum? Uh, yes, sorry, I can't see, but is there a, a comment? Please um, just go ahead. Um, yes, I'm uh, from Vietnam. Um, I'm in, uh, we are interested in MGI, yes, and, and we think that it's very important to, uh, to evaluate migration governance and also to measure the implementation of the Global Compact for Migration. And uh, right now, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Vietnam is uh, discussing with IOM mission in Vietnam to, um, to, to, to conduct this. So I hope that in the time to come, we will use it toolkit to, um, to evaluate our, my, our current my, migration governance policies. And, and um, we think that because to implement this, well, it requires interagency cooperation. So that's, that's why in the next two weeks, um, the, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Vietnam will uh, organize a annual review conference on the implementation of the Global Compact for Migration, and we will discuss the MGI toolkit. Uh, so we will seek support from other agencies and ministries concerned so that we will um, uh, submit our, uh, our official request to IOM and also, of course, to our mission in Vietnam. And thank you for uh, hosting this side event because it really um, served our interest. And I hope that we will receive some uh, uh, support from IOM and also um, countries concerned, uh, especially uh, those who already are uh, using it, so we can learn from that. And, um, and it also to help to reevaluate our current plan on, on uh, GCM implementation. And, and, and also, I take this opportunity to uh, extend my sincere thanks to um, the Bureau of P Population, my Jeffries and uh, Migration, who, who, uh, who is strong supporter for us in, within the framework of Asia Migration Program. I thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much, and um, it's uh, really exciting to hear, and uh, that's, that's really, really encouraging uh, that there is this uh, interest, and that there is this ongoing work that's really, really important, really great to hear, and um, I'm sure um, I'll let I I IOM speak to that, but I'm sure there's um, a lot of potential there, so really thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, I think that uh, in the interest of time, we're uh, coming to a close. So uh, from my side, I just want to thank everyone uh, again. Um, and I'll just hand over um, to DDG Daniels for um, closing uh, remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Maxis. And thank you, everyone, um, for participating. I have to start off with thanking um, our distinguished panelists from Nepal, from the U.S., from Brazil, and from uh, Mauritius. 
uh, not just for participating, but for really sharing the diverse perspective and um, would I say the way MGI has been used in their particular context. Um, I'm not going to even attempt to, to summarize it, and Matus, you had done a lot of that. Um, I really like the idea, um, uh, Elizabeth, of the using the existing MGI um, assessments to look at, well, the data from the assessments to look at um, um, good entry points for labor pathways. And I'm actually a bit bummed I didn't think of it myself, but... <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, but certainly, um, uh, we'd be very keen um, to do that. Um, a particular thank you to the um, uh, delegate from Vietnam. That was a great question and exactly what we hoped that this side event would um, stimulate amongst um, member states. While you were asking the question, I was having a small a mini council here <laughs> with my colleagues. And certainly we can use um, MGI to evaluate uh, the implementation of policies. We've done this in Cambodia. We're currently in discussion um, with Thailand. And then with regard to GCM, um, GCM plan of implementation, we have um, examples from Indonesia. So everything that I guess was on your, that you requested. We certainly have the capacity and experience to do. And then finally, in terms of peer-to-peer -peer networks between member states, we don't have this in Asia. We do have it in the Americas, but we can certainly look into it for, um, uh, uh, for the Asia Pacific region. And then um, for my, my closing words, I really hope that uh, all of you who've had the real opportunity to listen to what our panelists have shared and thinking about its application in your own um, context, um, I hope the diversity of what you've heard um, can help that. Certainly as IOM, we stand more than ready and available to support um, member states in um, in the, in the diverse application of, of MGI. And, you know, going back to the title that it's about people, um, yes, the, the focus is on, it's on policies, but it's on policies that work for people, and it's also on a process that involves people and, and involves a diverse range of stakeholders who all have a stake in the implementation of a policy or the outcomes of a policy. So we really hope you keep that in mind as you, um, as you consider how to use MGI in your particular context, to work for the people in your context, whether it's migrants in your country, whether it's migrants, it's, whether it's your migrants in other countries, Certainly we've heard about the regional perspective um, and cooperation that um, MGI, uh, um, MGI has supported. So once again, thank you to our panelists and thank you to all of you um, for IOM. It's such an honor to be um, your partner and collaborator in making sure that migration works for everyone. Thank you.